Ready to get in the Word this morning? All right, it's got Bibles open to James chapter 2. We're going to dive in. Now, before I get into the text, I want to uh, take you through a, a little scenario. Jesus said about the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 23, 6, Jesus said, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important, what? Seats in the synagogues. So you've all got your seats this morning. Are you happy with your seats, right? I want you to think back. I want you to ask yourself the question, what's, what's the best seat you've ever had, right? What's the best seat you've ever had? Maybe it was a sporting event, and you went through and you looked at the prices for the different tiers, and, you know, you decided, uh, VIP. Now, the best seat I've ever had, uh, to be honest with you, a friend of mine who I knew uh, liked the Nuggets invited me and my wife, along with he and his wife, to a Nuggets game. This was several years back. And he said, yeah, I've got some seats. And I, I knew this guy. I knew he liked the Nuggets, and I knew he had some pretty good seats. I didn't know exactly where, but I figured they'd be pretty good. And so we walked into the stadium. We kept walking. We kept walking down the stairs. I'm thinking, wow, this is a lot further down than I've ever been. And then we got right down to the end zone, end line of the, of the basketball, right? And then we sat right on the front side of the court, court side seats. I'm like, wow, these are awesome. Now, I was curious. Is that the heater? <laughs> That's loud. Um, I was curious, not about the heater. Um, how much were court side seats? I, of course, didn't ask him. I was a guest. Like, I'm going to ask him, hey, how much were these? Um, so I Googled yesterday, and then I called the Pepsi Center yesterday to see how much courtside seats were. And uh, those particular seats that we sat on, and it's different for every game. It's different for the open, uh, season opener. It's different depending on who they're playing. Playoffs, of course. But those seats that we sat in years ago were $1,600 a per a person a year, you know, years ago. I thought, you got to be kidding me. $3,200? What's the math? 6400 um, I hope you got those comped. <laughs> Those were expensive. Good seats, right? Now, what's the worst seat you've ever had? What's the worst seat you've ever sat in? And when I say that, I automatically go to airplanes, right? Anybody? Now, a couple of uh, a year ago, my uh, wife and I with some friends from the church, we went on vacation, and we all, I looked at my seat, and here's the deal. I don't know why it is whenever I book, no matter who I book with, the Hoovers get the back of the plane. I don't know if it's because we suck, right? So we get the back, get it, Hoover. So we get the back of the plane. It's the worst. It's the worst because you got the most amount of right, activity back there and all the rest. And it was funny because as we were going to get on the plane, and of course I saw my seating chart and where Karen and I were going to be. And, and then uh, my friends, they got called to the front, and he came back with a big smile on his face. What happened? He said, oh, we got bumped to first class. You, you got bumped to first class. Why? You know, and, and, and it was a whole different deal. And so they were sitting there in first class. And have you ever noticed when you walk by first class, do you ever look at those peeps and think, how do you guys afford this? Have you ever priced a first class ticket? It is not cheap. It's ridiculously expensive. And then they've got that curtain. What is that all about? Here's this curtain. It's just really sheer and it's small. But it's that kind of way of saying, mm, yeah, you aren't us. You're back there with the riffraff, right? The worst seats that you got. The best seat in the house, the worst seat in the house. Now, let me ask you a question. When it comes to those seats, in all of these examples, there's a phrase that we like to say, you get what you pay for, right? I say that all the time to my kids. You get what you pay for. Buy once, buy right. But you get what you pay for when it comes to a concert and the seat that you want to have. Those people that paid for those VIP seats, right, up front, those were expensive. And you and I, up in the top, not so much, wherever we are. Now, are you mad at the people in first class when you walk by? Are you mad at them like, you know, it's not right, it's not fair. Are you mad about the VIPs in the concert right up front when the rope gets pulled back, they get rushing in, you're up at the top in the nosebleeds? Do you get mad at that? Do you get mad when those people, like right on the court side? Now, realize I called and I asked yesterday, and I told him it was for the purposes of this sermon. I said, well, how much would it be if I wanted to sit right at the 50 or right at the half line there where it is that the Nuggets are playing? How much would that seat right there, right on the court? He said, you can't even get that seat. <laughs> what? 
Yeah, you can't even get that seat. You have to be a VIP. And then you can buy the seat if you're, well, okay, I'm, well, that doesn't make you mad. No, I don't think it really does. You get what you pay for. If those folks want to sit there, if they want to spend the money, they deserve to have that. I don't want to spend or allocate that kind of money, don't have it anyway, so I'm where I'm at and where, where we're at. Now, let's just say for the sake of the sermon today, let's just say that we decided to make a little change here at Vista at Church. In the future, you're going to have to log on before service, and you're going to have to look at the seating chart, and you're going to have to decide where you want to sit and how much you want to pay for those seats where you're going to sit. And let's just, for the sake of argument, theoretically, let's just say it's going to cost you the closer to the front you sit, because that's how it is always, even though there's always empty seats up front. But let's just pretend that these were the hottest seats. I spit, I guess. I don't know. Let's just say, along with that, you can click if you want prayer afterwards. It'll cost you. It's an upcharge. <laughs> Let's say if you want to take communion, well, that's an upcharge. You're going to have to pay a little for more of that. If you want any of the other, if you want to go out to lunch afterwards with, with one of the leaders, well, that's going to cost you, and then you're going to have to pay for lunch too, by the way. Now, let me ask you this. How do you feel about that? Does that make you mad? Do you look at that and say, well, that's not right? I mean, there's a difference in those things. If the people want to pay for the seats at the sporting event, that's fine. If the people want to pay for the seats at the concert, that's fine. Or first-class seats on an airplane, that's fine. But when it comes to the church, if we were to have that same kind of construct, I'm relatively certain some of us would say, I don't agree with that. So I want you to hold on to that concept. I want you to hold on to that thinking. Let's look at James chapter 2, and we're actually going to start in the second verse. I'm going to hold the first verse for the very end of the sermon. James says in verse 2, here we go, seats. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. Now that would be, this guy is wealthy, right? He pulled up in the Bentley. He came in with the entourage. He was blinged out. I called this, this sermon um, blinded by the bling. This guy would have rings all over his finger, gold chains. I mean, it would have been obnoxious, right? He would have had a fine Italian suit with a $1,000 Italian leather shoes. I mean, everything about this guy would have screamed success. He's somebody. He's important. And then James says, and suppose a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. Obviously, this guy doesn't make what the first guy makes, right? This guy, he's a little bit different. Maybe he's homeless even. He's obviously a nobody in terms of the world's perspective. And then James says in verse 3, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat, what did the religious leaders want? They wanted the best seats. They wanted the best seats in the synagogue. Well, here in this church, the usher says, hey, you, you, yeah, come on up. Here's a good seat for you. This is our VIP section right here. That's how it is that they respond to the rich man. And then he says, but you say to the poor man, you stand there. In other words, <laughs> not in front. Uh, or even sit on the floor by my feet. Go ahead and be my footstool, right? Now, you got to realize in that day, there weren't a lot of seats in synagogues anyway. And oftentimes, people would stand out on the back, those that didn't have much. But those who had a lot, and they even sometimes paid for their seats in the synagogue. Um, the reality is those people were special. Those people were valuable as far as the culture would say. Those people were important. But this guy was like a footstool. Here, let me put my dirty, stinky feet. Remember, open-toed sandals, walking on roads where animals excreted. It was not a pretty picture. Feet were not clean. And he's saying, you can go ahead and be the footstool because you're poor and a nobody. Stay out of the way. James says with this scenario about these seats and these people, he says in verse 4, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with what kind of thoughts have you not had evil thoughts about these guys have you not judged these individuals the rich man with the bling he's important the rich man with the rings and all the stuff he's valuable he deserves to have a special place but the poor man seems to be a nobody uh, shabby clothes he says and they didn't have washing machines 
And if you were poor, you oftentimes didn't smell very well, and your clothes were like the bottom of the barrel clothes, and you would oftentimes stink quite grossly. And he looks at that, and he says, this man has no value or importance. And James says, you're judging, evaluating the two men with evil thoughts. He's not done, though. He says in verse 5, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? And to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? You see, the truth is, some people who don't have a lot in this world, they've got to trust God in ways that sometimes people who have a lot don't. And he says about this poor people and the poor guy, he says they're really rich, they just don't have their inheritance yet. He he says these folks, they're storing up for themselves treasures in heaven, they have a massive inheritance, they just haven't cashed it in yet. He wants to give them that kind of perspective, and he continues with the problem, verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor. You have insulted the poor. Now, remember, James is a pastor, and James has a pastor's heart, and apparently what's happening at their church is somebody decided that what you would do at a concert and that what you would do at a sporting event is the same thing that should be done at church. James is saying, no, you're dishonoring the poor. And and think about James. Remember, in the beginning of this series, I talked about his family, Mary and Joseph, right? They were what? They were poor. And and James is saying, you would have treated my father like that. You would have told my father, sit in the back or sit down on the floor next to my feet. You know, if James or Jesus walked into this church, you know, if Jesus walked into this church, Jesus would have been in the back according to this construct. Jesus would have been sitting down at their feet according to how they were treating people. And it isn't right, and it's dishonorable. And you start to get the idea that the world and the church are supposed to operate differently, right? There's supposed to be something very different about how we treat people in the church than how the world treats each other out there there's not supposed to be the same kind of thinking none of us have a problem going to a sporting event or a concert or on a flight and paying for a seat and whatever we pay determines where we are but when it comes to the church that's troubling to say the least james says in verse six is it not the rich who are exploiting you exploiting you are they not the ones who are dragging you into court now don't misunderstand Not all rich people are evil, right? (laughs) Not all rich people are evil, but according to this, these rich people were evil. These rich people were hurting the others in the church, the poor people in the church. They were oppressing them, and they were taking advantage of the poor who couldn't legally defend themselves because they didn't have the money to defend themselves. And he says in verse 7, Are they, the rich, not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? In other words, Some of these rich people were coming in and acting like they were believers when they weren't believers, like Judas, right? One of Jesus' own 12. There are those that come in and they were slandering the name. They were taking advantage. They were even hiring. This is bared out in the rest of scripture. A lot of these rich people were hiring these poor folks. And then when it came time to pay them, guess what they didn't do? They would say, sorry, we're not paying you. They had no legal recourse. They had no money in terms of going to the court system, and so they were being taken advantage of. Now, I want you with that kind of thinking to think how they would have felt, the poor people, if they saw the very individuals, the rich people, who were taking advantage of them, who were taking them to court and suing them, or who were not paying them. Think of how those poor people on the back outskirts of the church would have felt if those people were brought right up front in the church and said, you bet, sit right here in the VIP section. Why? Because you're wealthy, you're rich, you're valuable, and you're important. Folks, it's not the way it should have been. And here's my question. Here's the question I have. Does this bother you, yes or no? Yeah? Yeah? Does it bother you? How many of you say, yeah, this actually bothers me? That's not right. That's why it's in the Word. That's why we're going to talk about this this morning. And trust me, it's really not about seats, as you're going to see. It's about attitudes, and it's about the heart. Amen? So does this bother you? Yes. The second question I ask is, 
Why? Why does it bother you? Because right away, I know we want to rush to moral indignation. Right away, we want to say, well, that, that's just not right. That's wrong. People should be able to sit wherever they want. It shouldn't be based upon how much money you have, especially not in the church. That's just not right. And I would say I agree. You're using the God-given conscience that you have. It's not right. But the reality is, folks, what basis do you have to make that kind of moral determination? What basis do we have to make that kind of moral determination? If you're here this morning, and maybe not here this morning, but if you know of somebody who's not a Christian, and they have this same kind of indignation, but yet they have a pure evolutionary theory, that person has no right to be upset. If somebody has a purely evolutionary theory, they have no right to be upset. Why? Because evolution and the theory of that worldview says some people are more advanced than others. That's the whole idea. Some people win and some people lose, according to a purely evolutionary theory about life. It's the weak against the strong and only the fittest survive, right? That's this whole idea. So if the rich guy wins and the poor guy loses, well, that's just you know, how it is in terms of church seating charts. That's just survival of the fittest, man. You got no way to get mad about that. That's what that whole idea teaches. And you know, that kind of worldview doesn't allow you to argue against how partiality and use words like prejudice or discrimination because it flies in the face of their ideology. So if somebody has that kind of worldview, hey, you can look at this and say that's not right, but you're really being a hypocrite. Secondly, there are people who are very religious. They have a religious worldview, and they too might say, well, that's not right. I agree. That's wrong. It shouldn't be that way. And I would again ask, why? What problem do you have if you're a religious person? Because the difference between Christianity and other religions is in other religions, you get what you earn. You get what you earn in other religions. But in Christianity, you get what Jesus earned, right? Grace. It's a very different thing. Because we believe in Jesus, we believe in grace, and we believe that people should be treated equal. But if you believe in a religious ideology or a philosophy about life then some believe in karma how many of you understand karma that some people have paid off more debt than others and if they're suffering in this life karma says we shouldn't help them because we could be interrupting their karma payback and so we're actually getting in the way and then there's other religions that teach levels of enlightenment that some of us have reincarnated and some of us have become more enlightened and some of us are more involved. And so, in this religious idea, if you're more involved, evolved, if you're more enlightened and the rest of us are more primitive, then the primitive seat people sit on the floor and the enlightened people, they get the best seats right up front. They've gotten to a higher state of consciousness. See, religion teaches you you earn it. You pay for your seat through your enlightenment, through your good works, through your reincarnation and paying off your karmic debt, through your evolutionary consciousness. You earn your seat. And some people get a better seat than others because according to these philosophies, some people are just better than other people. And again, as I lay out those ideas, purely evolutionary theory, karmic thought, karma, and that whole idea, or, or the idea of reincarnation and being more enlightened, you know, Deepak Chopra, all this kind of stuff. If you hear that and you say, well, wait a minute. Some people are just flat out better than others because they're more enlightened, they're further along, and they deserve better. If again you say, well, I don't agree with that either, I would say that's your conscience. That's what God has given you. <laughs> and that being said, let's get back to the text because it, it's relevant. James' problem, and he's pointing out, the church is behaving in a worldly way. The church is behaving in a worldly way. That's why he's pointing this out and writing this for these churches. What are you guys doing? We have no right to treat people like that based upon their perceived worth, based upon their perceived importance, their perceived value. We shouldn't treat people that way. Now, biblically, we understand that the church 
we're, we're in something called the world, right? But we also know that because we believe in what the Bible teaches, that the kingdom of God exists as well, right? Now, we know ultimately the kingdom of exo God exists in heaven and will be there for eternity. But until then, Jesus came to preach the kingdom. And there's an element of the kingdom here on this world that we live in. But we also aren't there yet, so we're kind of caught in the middle to the ways of this world, which I've just described to you. You get what you earn. Rich people are better, more important. Those that are popular, those that have done more, accomplished more, they're to be more valued. Poor people who don't have much and haven't accomplished much, you know what, put them out of our way. That's the world system. And the reality is, folks, while we live in this world, um, there are values and cultures and worldviews that don't submit to King Jesus, do they? And we're stuck in the middle, and it gets messed up, according to James, when the church sometimes thinks in a way that's more worldly and less like Jesus' kingdom. They're guilty, the church is, according to James, of showing something called partiality. Your Bibles say that. They're showing preference. They're showing this idea of we're partial to a certain group over another. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on finances alone. It's not really, like I said, about the money necessarily, though in this case, that's the specific point. James isn't saying rich people are bad and poor people are good. That, that, if you think about that, that's poverty theology, and it exists in the world. If you're rich, you shouldn't be. You should be poor. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's called poverty theology, and it exists. James also isn't saying poor people are bad and rich people are good. You know what that is? That's prosperity theology, and that's all over the place as well. You all should be rich. If you believe in Jesus, you should be rich, wealthy, and healthy. Nothing should be bad in your life. Well, both of those theologies are wrong because poor people aren't bad or good, I should say, and rich people aren't good. The Bible actually teaches we're all bad. <laughs> the Bible teaches we're all sinful. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, yeah? And so we can't elevate one over the other. The Bible says we're all equal, no matter what. We all need Jesus. So I want you to see this, the real issue, they were favoring one person over another. They were putting one person above another based upon outward appearance. And this kind of favoritism or partiality is contrary to the heart of God and it's contrary to the character of God. I'll give you two verses, all right? Um, I'm going to switch them up, Brian. Let's do Deuteronomy 10, 17 first. It says, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no God shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. That's his character. We're not talking about the people of God. We're talking about Father God here. He shows no partiality. Those are very strong words. And then in Leviticus 19, 15, we're told in the law, it says, Do not pervert justice. This is God speaking to his people. Do not show partiality to the who? To the poor or... He says, favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. We're all equal according to the law. That's huge. What God is saying is, don't show partiality to the poor and don't show partiality to the rich. Treat everyone fairly, equally, and justly because God is saying, that's how I treat people. You got to understand this whole idea of partiality, it actually starts with who God is. It starts with how God sees the world, how God sees people. He sees us all the same, and I'm going to get to the good stuff in a moment. But if we don't understand what he's talking about, then we can misunderstand the point of this teaching in the book of James because it's not teaching us to rearrange the seating chart. That's not what this is teaching us. Oh, well, if that's the case, okay, all the poor people are in the back, and let's bring the, let's bring the poor people and put them in front and let's put the rich people in the back. Now we've got it figured out, right? Rich people are in back, poor people are in front. No, no, that's not right. Let, let's reverse that. No. Well, okay. This isn't resolving our partiality if you do that. This is just changing our partiality, right? <laughs> Take it out of the financial realm. Um, all the women up front. All the men in the back. How's that? Does that make everybody happy? Probably half of us, if you're a woman. No, 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 that's not good. That, that's, that's not good. Let's put all the women in the back and bring all the men to the front. Now we're doing right, right? 
hey, let's, let, let, let's, put all, let, let's put all the educated people up front. Educated people up front. If you've got a bachelor's, uh, anyone who's not educated, you're in the back. No, 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 let's do the reverse. Uneducated people, you should be up front. You see, we could lay out all, if, if you're white, come on up front. White people up front. Black people in the back, right? Anyone who's not white in the back. Don't worry, we're, we're, we're getting to the truth. <laughs> you're like, oh, is he saying this? This is the idea that exists, and I'll get to the relevant part of this even regarding race, sexism, ageism. If you're old, come on up front. We want you in the front because you deserve If you're young, go to the back. No, 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 that's not good. Young people, young people, come on up front, old people in the back. You see, this isn't just about finances. What it comes down to is preferences. What it comes down to is partiality. What it comes down to, folks, is what James says and what Moses says and what God says is we don't need to be, have people like us to be up front. No, we're going to say that people like you are good <laughs> and people like you are bad. People like you, we all need to see each other the same. It's not about favoritism because if we go for favoritism and partiality, no matter what we prefer, then we get, like I said, classism, we get ageism, we get racism, we get nationalism, we get tribalism. And so James tells us the solution. And the solution, biblically, is that we treat people equally because they are equal, because that's what the Bible says. You can't get to equality through evolution. You realize that. Evolution preaches something entirely different. You can't get to equality, like I'm talking about here. Everyone's equal in God's eyes because we're all made in the image. You can't get there from religion. Because religion says those who work harder and do better, they are better and they deserve more from God. And it's just not the truth. So let's do a little quiz. You guys come to church to take a quiz this morning? Yeah, right. Let's do it. According to the Bible, true or false, everyone is equally made in the image and likeness of God. True or false? True. Men and women, young and old, rich and poor, black and white, equally made in the image and likeness of God. Second quiz, all people are equally fallen and sinful. True. There's not a race, there's not a gender or a class or a kind or a type of people that are not sinful. We're equal in our humanity and we're equal in our depravity. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans says. So people like you are no better than people who are not like you. Now, final quiz. It's a three pointer. True or false? Those who belong to Jesus are equally saved, equally loved, and equally forgiven. True or false? True. According to the Bible, we are equal, which means there is no place for favoritism and there is no place for partiality. See, the, the Bible elevates everybody. At the foot of the cross, it is level ground. Amen? I love that. At the foot of the cross, it is level ground. There's no higher place for those that are better, stronger, richer, faster, better looking, and then those who aren't, lower ground. None of that applies when it comes to the Bible. Now, I skipped verse 1 in the beginning, so I want to end with this verse, James 2, verse 1. He says, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Now, what he's saying here, here is don't play favorites. Don't show favoritism. And we've already seen, because Deuteronomy and Leviticus told us, that God doesn't show favoritism, does he? No partiality, he says. And I'm a father, too. God the Father doesn't show favorites to his children. And I'm a father, too. I've got two daughters, I've got one son, and I've got zero favorites. All my kids, I love them the same. The last thing I ever want is for any one of my kids to think, well, I, I prefer you over him. Or I prefer you over her. Whenever there's favoritism in a family, it always leads to disaster, right? Jealousy. When parents play favorites, it is a recipe for disaster. The Bible very early on showed us that, right? Jacob and Esau. Jacob was his mom's close little son. Esau was his dad's favorite. They both had favorites. And guess how Jacob and Esau related to each other? Nothing but disaster, right, until the very end. Well, there was another guy who showed favorites. Jacob, who became Israel, he showed a favorite towards who? Joseph and his coat, his electric coat of many colors. Now, how did that go with his brothers? 
They wanted to kill him because dad preferred Joseph. Dad blessed Joseph more, and it created absolute havoc in the family. So James starts by saying, my brothers, and you can read that, my sisters as well. We are God's family. And as God's family and God's children, God is our father, and he loves us all equally. So stop for a moment. How would this go? You know, my kids are all grown. How would this go if we were having Thanksgiving and they were all bringing their families back? And I said, as we all sat down getting ready to have Thanksgiving, uh, not even seated yet, and I said to them, all right, I want to know how much you all made this last year. Give me, give me your balance sheet. How much did you bring in? Why, Dad? Well, be, because whoever made the most, whoever made the most gets to sit closest to me. That's how it's going to work at the table. Who, whoever didn't make the most, right? Or, or how about if I said, tell me your GPA. Who, which one of you is smartest? Let me see them. Why, Dad? Well, because whoever is smartest, um, you get to sit next to me, and whoever had the lowest GPA gets to do the dishes, right? I mean, would that not be whack? What kind of father would that be? What kind of family arrangement would that be? And the truth is, folks, God's not like that. God's not like that at all. God's a father who loves all his kids, and he doesn't play favorites. Who says amen to that? He doesn't play favorites, but the problem is sometimes his kids do. God doesn't play favorites, but sometimes his kids do. We have a way of seeing people differently. So let me put it in your lap this morning. What about you? Who do you treat differently? Who do you prefer? Who are you partial toward? Do you prefer men or women, young or old, single or married, black or white, educated or uneducated, people who have their lives together or people whose lives are falling apart because it makes you feel better as well? Who do you prefer? And let me say this. Don't let your preferences become your prejudices. Don't let your preferences become your prejudices And it's sad sometimes, folks, because Christians and Christianity, we get accused of being um, bigots. We get accused of being elitists and feeling like we're better than the rest of the world. We we get accused as being haters. And some think that even Christianity is a religion of inequality. We, We rate people differently by how good or bad we are. It is, though, I would submit to you, the only religion of equality. Christianity is the only religion of equality. I'll give you another verse. Galatians 3, verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized. Now, don't get hung up on the word sons. Ladies, where's daughters? He's going to talk about you in a minute. You're all sons, and read that, daughters, because you're included in this, of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Jesus with Christ there is neither because of that there is neither what Jew nor Greek slave nor free male or female for you are all one in Christ we're all the same at the foot of the cross amen we're all the same in terms of how God sees us biblical thinking that we're equally made by God we're equally fallen into sin We're equally loved and saved and forgiven by God. And that God's a father and he loves all of his kids equally. He doesn't have favorites and he doesn't have prejudices and preferences. That's what the Bible teaches. It it, is so clear. In fact, without a biblical worldview, the world would be a very different place. Consider sexism. Sexism. One sex is better than the other. Men are better than women. It's the Bible that tells us men and women are equal. And they're equally made in the image and likeness of God. The Bible shows us that Jesus befriended women. The Bible shows us that Jesus taught women. That would have been scandalous in that day. Rabbis did not interact with women. That's why the disciples were so aghast when he was with that woman at the well. What are you doing? You can't be talking to a woman. You're a rabbi. Not only did Jesus, he he include women. Not only did he talk to women and teach women, he actually had women on his ministry team. A part of what he did, his whole group. (laughs) Go to nations where the gospel hasn't spread and see if women are treated as equals under the law. If you know your worldview and world uh, approach, 
they're not in so many places where Christianity or the gospel isn't something that's permeated. Consider racism. I said I was going to talk about it. Racism is in large part the result of unbiblical thinking. That racism teaches that people, some of them, are part human and part animal. That's where these folks get off on this. They, some people are part human and part animal. And let me ask you, can you get there from the Bible, yes or no? No. There are animals and there are image bearers of God, and we don't believe as Christians, and the Bible doesn't teach as Christians, that there are variations in between. And that's why racism is completely antithetical and deplorable in the Bible and the view of the Bible. And that's why those who argued against slavery historically tended to do so from the Bible. In the time of the Romans with the Bible, when it was happening and Jesus was there, and then the early church, slavery was a very common thing in the early Roman Empire, right? It happened quite common. There were a lot of slaves. Until a lot of those slaves began to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they got saved and then they became deacons in the church. They became elders in the church. They became leaders in the church. And some of them, as slaves, they had more authority in the church over their masters who had authority over them in the world. And it created this confusion, and it began to, over time, transform culture as the Bible elevated people, all people, women and slaves as well, and it began to change that whole thinking until later on in history, slavery in terms of the Roman Empire didn't exist the same way. We've had our issues, and we all know those. But biblically speaking, it was something that the Bible changed, and it transformed the culture just like the gospel transformed the church. Think of men like William Wilberforce, if you know your history, from Great Britain. William Wilberforce, he argued against slavery because he had a biblical worldview. Think of the civil rights movement, which was in large part led by pastors from pulpits, right? And they were teaching and preaching that all people were equally made in the image and likeness of God. Men like Martin Luther King Jr., who was a pastor. Not perfect, he had his issues. But he was a guy who believed in Jesus Christ, and he talked about that from a biblical worldview. Men like Jackie Robinson, who was an amazing baseball player, and he was a liberator, and he, it's not often said, loved Jesus as well. Women like Rosa Parks, right? It's not said very often that she was a Christian, but she was. And she was told to sit at the back of the bus, right? Same kind of thing we're dealing with in the text. You sit in the back. And the reality is she said, no. No, I'm not going to sit in the back. And she stood her ground and sat up front, and Rosa Parks did so from a biblical world view. Folks, this is powerful to think about all of these ways. Biblical thinking alone leads to dignity. It leads to value, equality among all people, and nothing else accomplishes that. And, you know, someone might say, well, it really sounds like you're hijacking a cultural value, Pastor. And I would say, no, it's been hijacked, and God wants it back. We need to see people the way that God sees people people because today right in here there are rich people sitting next to poor people there are, are are young people sitting next to old people and in other churches you know what there are highly educated and this church people sitting next to people that have little to no education because this is what christianity brings into existence through a clear teaching of the bible it's why even as christians we value those who are born and we value those who are unborn because all people matter in the eyes of God. We believe all people are equally loved by their father, our father, and we believe that they have rights and worth and that to show partiality is to behave in such a way that is evil and against the heart of our King Jesus. And that's what I want to end focusing on today, our King Jesus, because folks, this is where it gets good. Where you sit and where I sit doesn't matter. They, though they had different seats, they thought that those seats came with different glory. And the truth is none of that matters in God's kingdom. It matters to us in the world because we ascribe greater glory to certain people, don't we? We ascribe greater honor to certain people groups, celebrities and actors. Uh, I, I'm a big NBA fan, and boy, I just, these guys have so much attention on them. They are God's in this world in so many ways in the eyes of so many people because of the money they make 
because of what they can do with a basketball, and I'm not criticizing them. I'm saying the ways that we give honor and glory to certain groups, certain peoples, people who have accomplished big things, people who are famous. We ascribe glory, and we put value on different people with value judgments, but according to Jesus, the only one who deserves the glory is Jesus Christ, amen? Uh, that, that's the only one that de deserves the glory. According to Jesus, the only seat that matters is his seat. And that's why James says, speaking of his brother in verse 1, my brothers as believers in our, and I have it, it, it's stressed and emphasized in bold and italics, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. He says we are believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Glory is a mega theme in the Bible. Glory is mentioned over 275 times in the Bible. And when glory is interpreted and when the word is put in English, uh, it, it has a massive thing and it means a number of things. Splendor, beauty, magnificence, radiance, heaviness, weightiness, prominence, preeminence, luminescence, majesty, purity, worthiness. It's all glory. And what our world says is, hey, give me the glory. But put me up front. That's what our world says. And don't just put me up front. Focus on me. Think about me. Give me the attention. And, and put people around me like me because that makes me happy. I want to be with people that I think are worth being around me. That's what our world says. And you know what, folks? We want the glory seat as sinful human beings. And Jesus is saying no. And he's saying it through his brother James. Jesus is the only one who deserves to sit on the glory seat. It doesn't matter where you sit. It doesn't matter where I sit. It only matters where he sits. In your life, is he on the throne of your life? That's a mega theme in the Bible. Who is ruling and reigning in your life? Is Jesus on the throne? Because if Jesus isn't on the throne of your life, guess what? You are. If Jesus isn't on the throne of your life, guess what? Somebody else is that you're valuing. Something that you're valuing. Money may be on the throne in your life. Position and power and possessions may be on the throne in your life. But Jesus and Jesus alone deserves to be on the glorious throne in your life, right? In this church, in this church, Jesus is the hero of this church. It's not about any pastor, about any worship team or leader. It's not about any leadership team. Jesus is on the throne in this church, amen? And my intent is to always keep Jesus on the throne in this church and the rest of us as God's children, black, white, young, old, male, female, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. It doesn't matter. We're all the family of God, amen? So who's fighting for the front seats next week? You know what? Let's fight to keep Jesus on the greatest seat in our lives because listen to this jesus alone is worthy of glory jesus alone can shoulder the glory he alone can endure glory and instead of trying to put ourselves on the place of glory we get to bask in his glory which is our joy amen we weren't meant to have a throne you and i were meant to bow before the throne of jesus christ jesus gets all the glory he is our glorious lord jesus christ and the rest of us we love each other as god's children one big happy family amen lord